This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Church Street United Methodist Church proudly presents Rejoice. Good morning and welcome to Rejoice, the weekly devotional program brought to you by Church Street United Methodist Church in Knoxville, Tennessee. My name is Matt Hampton and I am pleased to be one of the pastors at Church Street. On this morning's program, I'd like to consider what we mean when we use the word church. What is the church? Is the church primarily a building? Is it primarily an organization or an institution? Is it something else? Or is the church perhaps defined less by what it is and more by what it does? And so we begin with our first lesson from Scripture, a reading which gives us a glimpse of what the early church was and what it was doing. The reading is from the Epistle of James, chapter 5, verses 13 through 20. James writes, Are any among you suffering? They should pray. Are any cheerful? They should sing songs of praise. Are any among you sick? They should call for the elders of the church and have them pray over them, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord. The prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise them up, and anyone who has committed sins will be forgiven. Therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The prayer of the righteous is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being like us, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth yielded its harvest. My brothers and sisters, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and is brought back by another, you should know that whoever brings back a sinner from wandering will save the sinner's soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. This is the word of God for the people of God. Now let us pray. O oh God, you declare your almighty power chiefly in showing mercy and pity. Grant us the fullness of your grace that we, running to obtain your promises, may become partakers of your heavenly treasure through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. And now a time of music, a musical offering from the Church Street United Methodist Parish Men's Choir. They are singing Agnus Dei from Messe Cum Jubilo, a mass composed by the great French composer Maurice Duraflay. Agnus Dei translates Lamb of God. It is our prayer and our praise this morning. O Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, have mercy on us.
Our second scripture lesson is from Mark's Gospel, chapter 9, verses 38 through 50. John said to him, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. But Jesus said, Do not stop him, for no one who de does a deed of power in my name will be able soon afterward to speak evil of me. Whoever is not against us is for us. For truly I tell you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you bear the name of Christ will by no means lose their reward. If any of you put a stumbling block before one of these little ones who believe in me, it would be better for you if a great millstone were hung around your neck and you were thrown into the sea. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maimed than to have two hands and go to hell to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than to have two feet and to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to stumble, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and to be thrown into hell, where the worm never dies and the fire is never quenched. For everyone will be salted with, fi with, salted with fire. Salt is good, but if salt has lost its saltiness, how can you season it? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. Again, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. As I said a moment ago, this morning I'd like to consider the word church. Church, what does that word mean? And I'm not really asking about the textbook definition of the word, I'm more interested in what the word means to you and me personally. What sorts of images does the word evoke? What sorts of associations do we make of it? I suspect the word church is rather like that old familiar proverb, about the blind men and the elephant. Each man was asked to touch the elephant and to describe what an elephant is like. One touched the tusk and said an elephant is like a spear. One touched the leg and said an elephant is like a tree trunk, and so on. For some individuals, the church is a place of fear and self-loathing. Church is the place where they were harmed and abused and rejected. For others, church is a place of love and light and joy. It's the place where they were saved and lifted up. Some of us are somewhere between those two extremes, and I suspect that some of us have a kind of love-hate relationship with the church. Some of us might say we can't live with it and we can't live without it. When I think of church at its best, at Church Street United Methodist Church, Many images spring to mind. I think of Sunday morning worship, the prayers and the sermons, hearing our choirs singing with otherworldly beauty, and staring at particular panels of stained glass in our nave. My favorite images in stained glass at Church Street are the windows portraying St. Francis's brother Sun and sister Moon on the north wall of our chancel. So in short, when I think of church, at Church Street, I think of beauty and light. I touch this part of it, and I think to myself, this is what church is. It's worship. But there are other images that spring to mind as well. I think of our youth group on their fall retreat last year, the retreat they call SLAW, or Spiritual Life Advance. I think about their camaraderie in the way that they are a true community where each individual is valued and encouraged to shine. At the retreat last year, the youth group held an impromptu talent show, and it was brilliant. At one point, two of our youth members performed the song Creep by the band Radiohead simply with voice and guitar with absolutely no preparation, and it was one of the most beautiful and inspiring things I've ever heard, haunting and lovely and pure. And the whole weekend was like that. Beautiful souls expressing themselves together in worship and prayer and creativity. And so, when I think of church at Church Street, I think of community and camaraderie. I touch this part of it, and I think to myself, this is what church is. It's community. A community of persons doing the work of love and spiritual formation together. Then I think of the outreach ministries at Church Street 
I touch that part of it, and I think to myself, this is what church is. Church is a shelter from the storm where wounded people are welcomed and embraced and served. Depending on which part of it we touch, at its best, the church is all these things and many more. It's a cathedral of light. It's a gateway to heaven. It's a spiritual place. It's a community of friends. It's a shelter for the wounded and the weary. But there's another image of the church that I wish to share with you and to emphasize today. This image of the church was recently offered by Pope Francis. This is what Pope Francis said. He said, I see clearly that the thing the church needs most today is the ability to heal wounds and to warm the hearts of the faithful. It needs nearness, proximity. I see the church as a field hospital after battle. I see the church, Pope Francis said, as a field hospital after battle. As I consider the image of a field hospital, the first picture that springs to mind is from the television series MASH. And the thing that stands out to me in that image is that in a field hospital after battle, no one tries to hide their wounds. So can we say the same thing about the church? Is the church a place where we can sometimes expose our wounds and our scars in order to find healing together? I think that's certainly the image of the church we see in the epistle of James. James, the brother of Jesus, paints a picture of a church in which women and men are able to be honest about where they are. Are you feeling cheerful this day? Then sing a song of praise, he says. Are you feeling sorrowful? Then come and pray. Are you wounded and sick? Then share your wounds with the people around you and seek healing with them. Are you wayward and lost? Then come and share your confession with the people around you and seek to turn around. Certainly, this is an image of the church that we see time and time again in the New Testament. Bear one another's burdens, the apostle says in Galatians 6 and 2, and in this way you will fulfill the law. As I said earlier, there's an emphasis here not on what the church is, but on what the church does. And what is it that we are called to do? We are called to open our hearts to one another, to share one another's burdens, and to share healing with one another. In the words of Ecclesiastes, two are better than one, for if they fall, one will lift up the other. But woe to one who is alone and falls and does not have another to help. This is our calling, to be wounded healers to one another, to be priests who offer blessing and absolution to one another. This is part of what it means to be the church. It is to be a field hospital following a battle. Having said all this, I want to expose one of my scars to you. I am the adult child of an alcoholic. If you want to know what makes me tick, in part, if you want to know why I sometimes limp the way I do in life, this is partly the answer. But this is a wound and a scar that I've been able to expose to wise and caring people in my life. And for that reason, I have found a measure of healing for this wound. I have found that my scars are part of who I am. They help me to understand myself. They help me to grow. And understanding my own woundedness, they help me to serve others as a kind of wounded healer. Again, to borrow a phrase from Henry Nouwen. But I could never have gone on this journey of healing alone. I needed the help of other wounded healers every step of the way, and I still do. My father is an alcoholic who, when I was a young boy, prayed one day to Jesus to be freed from the desire to drink and miraculously found himself freed from the desire to drink. My dad prayed to Jesus to make him sober and a year to the day after praying that prayer, my sober dad remarried my mom and became to me the best kind of father. My family had experienced a miracle and my dad's alcoholism became for us a memory. 
Some 30 years later, however, the unthinkable happened. We learned that my dad was drinking again. We were all in a state of shock, to say the least. For three years, my dad battled this disease unsuccessfully. For three years, we prayed for another miracle. And then in December of 2013, we received our second miracle. My dad went into rehab. And for the second time in his life, as a man battling the disease of alcoholism, he found healing and renewal and recovery. I visited my dad in rehab one day. It was obvious that something miraculous had happened to him even early in that process. It was obvious that something had changed. So I asked him, what do they do here in this place that's been so helpful to you? What's the secret? This is what my dad said. He said, a group of us will sit down together. We share our stories. We open up to one another and we listen to one another without judgment. We speak the truth to one another, but without judgment. That's what we do. That was the miracle. Now, I don't want to oversimplify what happens in a 12-step program or related kinds of programs, but I want to take that snapshot that my dad gave me of individuals simply sitting together, loving, sharing, listening with, without judgment, supporting one another. The thing that blew my mind that day as I listened to my dad was the thought that here's a man who's been in church nearly all his life, and he's never experienced that kind of fellowship until now. Thank God for that rehab facility. Thank God for 12-step programs and other helpful programs. Thank God for doctors and therapists and human beings who know how to help other human beings on the journey of recovery. But again, isn't the church supposed to be a place of sharing and loving and listening without judgment too? Aren't we supposed to be a kind of field hospital following, our ba following a battle? In our gospel reading for today, Jesus' disciples come up to him and say, there are people out there healing and blessing in your name, and these people aren't one of us. They're not a part of our group. And Jesus says, leave them alone. If they're healing and blessing and helping others, leave them to it, because this is the work we were called to do. The more of, it's that, the more of it that's going on, the better. In closing, I want to make an observation about this process of healing that I'm talking about today. It goes back to what I said a moment ago. Our scars are part of who we are. They're part of our life's journey. But as such, they are part of our spiritual journey too, and we all have them. This is not about wallowing in our misery. It's not about blaming our parents or blaming our past for our problems today. But our scars are an indispensable part of what God uses to shape our lives today. Are there some pieces of our past that we ought to leave behind us? Absolutely. There's a song by the band Pearl Jam called Rearview Mirror, which says, Today I saw things so much clearer once you were in my rearview mirror. Sometimes a figure from my past will emerge and I'll say to my wife, I have put that person or that story squarely in my rearview mirror and that's where they will stay. But some of the pieces of my past are indispensable pieces of the mosaic that God is making of my life. As another song called Native Tongue by the singer-songwriter David Wilcox says, Build a bridge with what's behind you, the scattered pieces of your past. Build it out over the chasm to the promised land at last. Start a bridge with what's behind you, and God will pick up where you've begun. Because where you look is where God finds you, and God knows your native tongue. I offer you this sermon today as a kind of advertisement. What I'm advertising is small group life at Church UMC, to which I invite you, or perhaps small group life in some other place where you are. I hope you'll be on the lookout where you live for some kind of field hospital of the Spirit if you don't already have a place like that in your life. I hope that you'll find that place to share, to love, to listen without judgment, and I hope that you will be or become a wounded healer yourself. 
This is also an advertisement for a new worship service that we're planning to begin at Church Street UMC in January of 2016. We want this new worship service, which is planned for Thursday evenings beginning in January, to be a kind of special field hospital, a place for radical acceptance and healing and recovery. If this is something you think you'd like to experience or to support, please contact me at Church Street UMC and please keep us in your prayers. May our church and our churches be all that they can be with God's inspiration and help. A cathedral of light, a community of friends, a way station for the suffering, and a field hospital for the wounded and the weary. Let us pray. Lord, give us to see the many ways that your church lives in us. Help us to be your church, to your praise, to our salvation, and to the betterment of this world. In Christ we pray, amen. Fittingly, our closing musical selection today is Father, Hear the Prayer We Offer, as sung by Karen and Matt Cook of Church Street, UMC. As always, before we close, we'd like to invite you to join us sometime at Church Street United Methodist Church in Knoxville. We worship on Sundays at 8.30 a.m. and again at 11 a.m. and on Wednesdays at noon. If you're thinking of bringing your family, we have wonderful ministries with children and youth. If you want to participate in a faith community that makes a difference in the world, we have many opportunities to volunteer and to serve, including our benevolence program, our soup kitchen, our United Methodist Women's Sharing Shops, and our Beacon of Hope program in South Knoxville. We offer many opportunities to study and to learn, as well as small groups and a diverse range of Sunday school gatherings. And as you know, if you've watched this program for any time at all, we also have a music program that must be heard to be believed. It's also the case that if you are a spiritual seeker or someone who is uncertain about what you believe, but interested in participating in a community of caring and thoughtful people. We would love to hear from you and to get to know you. 
You can find out more about our church online at churchstreetumc.org or simply come by sometime and say hello. For now, thank you so much for joining us today. It is, as always, an honor and a joy to be with you wherever you are watching. So go now with God's blessing. Members and friends of Church Street United Methodist Church, your downtown church at the corner of Henley and Main, would like to thank you for joining Rejoice. Please send us your comments and suggestions, and be sure to tune in next Sunday at this same time for Rejoice. Rejoice.